Okay, in this video I want to show you a game that is probably going to be my crowning achievement in this lifetime. Um, so people ask if I play tournaments and the answer is no, I almost never have. Um, I got interested in chess when I was in my teens. Uh, unfortunately where I grew up in the middle of nowhere, um, there wasn't anybody to play chess with, so getting to tournaments was, wasn't really a possibility. And I played in a couple, but it was something I never really started doing a lot. Um, when I got to college, I played in a couple. So anyway, so I've probably played less than 50 slow games in my life. You know, probably even less than that. Maybe 30 tops. So the white pieces here are being played by the legendary Victor Korchnoi, one of the strongest players um, who never became world champion. He actually lost the world championship, I think, only by one game in 1978 when Fischer didn't decide to defend his title. He lost to Anatoly Karpov that match by one game. So um, if he had won that, he would have become the de facto world champion. Super strong player. He's actually still going today. Um, so this was in 2011 at the London Chess Classic. I happened to be there in London in 2011, and Victor was giving a simul, so I, I want to be clear on that. It wasn't just a mano y mano. He was giving a simul, but he decimated a lot of people really quickly, and it got down to a pretty small group. So I hadn't played a, a slow game in a long time, and I thought, you know, I don't want to just come out and get and get creamed by this guy. So I had to decide what opening to use. So the opening I decided to use, um, I was hoping he would start out with d4, but he opened with e4. And I decided to play c6. This is known as the Kirokan, and it's known as a very solid reply to um, to e4. And that's what I thought. I just want to play something solid. I have never played a slow game with the Kirokan in my life. So, you know, I, I know a couple moves of theory. I think a, a few days before, I decided to look at a, a couple lines briefly. And um, I was pretty much on my own really quickly. So I did get to a certain point. I'll, I'll show you where my theory runs out. So, okay, so e4, c6, d4, d5. This is normal uh, blacks challenging the center. Lots of different uh, possibilities here for white. Victor plays knight to d2. Capture the pawn. Uh, knight captures. And now I played knight f6. So challenging this knight in the center. Well, Victor uh, captures the knight, and now there's two different options. Uh, there's g takes f6, and there's e takes f6, and they lead to different types of positions. g takes f6, again, I barely remember, but this is a much more double-edged uh, position. Black ends up getting this open file for his rook. He, he, he captures towards the center. But white or black's king is a little a little nervous in the center, and there's a lot of tactical lines. If I remember correctly, in some lines, he even you even give up this h pawn. But uh, I decided to play uh, e takes f6, and oddly enough, this is known as the Korchnoi variation of the Kirokan. It's named after him. This line, I guess he used it a lot to to in, in answer to e4. So. I either thought this is going to be really brilliant or really stupid, but there's there's a known psychological trick in chess where oftentimes people will play, you know, maybe your opponent has some favorite line, and you, you would think, well, hey, they're the expert in that line, but a lot of times an opponent will play that same line, and the idea is your your opponent knows all, in a sense they say they're playing against themselves because they know all these lines, and they're starting to think maybe you do too, so... It was interesting when I played this move. He kind of stopped and hunched over the board and and waved his head side to side and made kind of a, a you know a funny face like, well, what do I do now? Um, and he he stopped and, and and started thinking and and I thought, well, maybe that's good. So okay, so let's keep going. Just developing now. Knight f3, um, bishop d6. Again, I'm just trying to get this bishop developed somewhere, and I want a castle. e7 doesn't make sense. It's just blocked in behind this pawn. At least on d6, it's got control of this diagonal. Playing to b4 to give a check is just pointless. Um, it's just something like that, you know, white would just play c3. So that didn't make any sense to me. So I just played bishop d6. Same thing. Um, white's going to keep developing. I think bishop d3 would be, to me, a more natural move just to cover this f5 square from the bishop. But uh, 
who am I to, to, to critique Victor Korchnoi? He plays bishop e2, uh, castle, castle. And now, um, I mean, really at this point, even after uh, e takes f6, I was out of, I don't, I didn't know any of the theory at this point. I was just improvising. So here I started having to figure out uh, where do I place my pieces? Now, the computer actually recommends knight a6, which is a, a move that I wouldn't even consider for a moment. I wouldn't ma I wouldn't be worried about the doubled pawns so much. Um, it's just this knight feels very... Uh, it, does, it doesn't feel like it's doing anything to me for the moment. You can always reroute it via uh, c7 to e6, and you'll actually see the knight ends up on e6 anyway. So the idea by putting... Uh, the knight on a6 is in some lines you can play bishop f5 and then play a knight to b4. But again, that's not at all what I did. I just played rook e8, just to keep developing, put this rook on this open file was my, my logic. And I, I basically wanted to get this, this knight to, to e6 in some lines, and uh, rook e8 helps me get that knight to e6, and you'll, you'll see. So at this point, I was thinking again, you know, white doesn't have any real weaknesses, so I don't have any targets just yet. It's just time to just to try to keep developing and hopefully put my pieces in a useful square. So he immediately plays c4, gaining some space on the queen side. And I thought, well, okay, you know, what can we do? Again, knight a6 seems to be the, the move. I didn't consider it. I played here just knight d7. So you can see all my pieces are kind of, you know, on the, the first three ranks. So he's already gaining a lot of space. So again, my position's solid, but I do have to be careful here. So he plays c5, immediately taking more space. Somehow I didn't really expect that move, but I mean, it does make sense. He's, he's gaining all this space on the, the, the queen side. Not really many reasonable moves here for the bishop. I don't want to put it back here on b8 because it's going to interfere with my with my rooks. So I just played bishop e7. There's really nowhere else. I don't want to put it back on f8 because that's where my knight's going to go to. And the same thing, I don't want to put it on e7. I could have just done that at the very beginning. Okay, so he's gaining more space on the queen side, playing b4. Um, again, not developing his pieces, but gaining space. And at this point, <clears throat> from this move on, the computer actually gives me an advantage the rest of the game. So um, I will warn you, the game kind of uh, ends rather rather suddenly, but uh, we still have a little ways to go. So he plays b4, gaining even more space. So at this point, I played knight f8. And at this point, um, I'm thinking this d-pawn is my target. That's the, the weakest point in his position that I can find. And notice he can't push the pawn because I have you know the queen covering it and the pawn covering it. So from here on out, my whole game is based on trying to attack this d-pawn, and everything I do for the next, you know, 10 moves is going to be directed at that. So, and this is something in chess, <clears throat> you want to have a plan, and, and this is my plan, is to, to go after that d-pawn. Whether it's, it's the best plan or the worst plan, um, that remains to be seen. But, okay, so he plays bishop c4, again, putting this bishop on a more active diagonal. Notice this f7 pawn is, is a weakness in my position. Maybe he can play queen b3 at some point as well, attacking it, gaining some, some time to develop his pieces. But I just immediately uh, counter that bishop by playing bishop e6. And, again, the idea is if he takes, I'm going to take with a knight. And by getting the knight to e6, I'm putting more pressure on that d-pawn. Okay, so he plays queen d3, just uh, protects the bishop, and again, completes his development. Okay, same thing, I just want to keep developing my pieces, queen d7. Now my rooks are connected, and, you know, you, you typically want your rooks to be connected. They can start moving um, around on the back rank and find more active positions. So, he plays a4, again, taking even more space on the queen side. At this point, I was a little bit nervous. I thought... If I don't do something uh, immediate, I'm just going to get, he's going to play b5, and he's going to gain all the space on the queen side. Maybe play something like b5, exchange pawns. He can then play his rook over to b1 and have this open file. And I'm going to get squished on the queen side, and, and it's going to be big trouble. So the rule of thumb is when, and this is a good rule to remember if you're just beginning chess, or even if you're experienced, the rule of thumb is when somebody attacks on the flank, so either on the queen side or the king side, what you do is is you attack in the center because uh, the center is like prime real estate. These are you know this is this is like Manhattan here in the middle. Um, if you have if you control the center uh, just by 
just by controlling the center, it's easy to move to other parts of the board, and that's that turns out to be something very valuable. So controlling the center, counterattacking the center, is usually a, a more important thing than to be attacking on the side. So, okay, so I played bishop d5 here. So what on earth is the point of playing bishop d5? Well, again, I said this knight, or excuse me, this pawn on d4 is my target. Well, who's defending this pawn on d4? Well, the knight on f3 is defending it. So the threat now is to simply play bishop takes f3. And so suppose he just does something like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Rook b1. Well, that would be bad because of the because of this move. Suppose he does a, a rook a2. Um, even still, I think bishop e4 might be an okay move. Um, but here, I would probably naturally, for me, I probably would have taken the knight, queen takes, and now I'm going to take this pawn. So that's that's the basic threat. Depending on what he does, is I'm just trying. I'm threatening to remove this defender of the d pawn. So he plays bishop d5. Well. Okay, so again, this d pawn is my target, so I don't want to play with with by taking the the bishop with my pawn. Then I have this isolated pawn. It allows him total free reign on the on the queen side. Again, it's not terrible for me, but um, I, I decided to capture with the queen again to keep targeting this d pawn. So he plays bishop e three, completing his development, also over protecting that e pawn. So here comes that knight move finally I've been wanting to get in, knight e6. The knight is now doing something active. And notice that also in some lines could maybe uh, swing over to the king side and create some threats. But mainly this knight is putting pressure on that d pawn. Okay, so he plays rook to c1. Um, you know, that's not a move again that I really expected. Um, not to say it's bad, but uh, it's not a move that I expected. So it ends up going to a more active square, you'll see. So I, I guess it makes sense for sure. So uh, completing my development, I've got my rooks in the center. Um, again, uh, everything is starting to eye this d-pawn. So he plays queen c4, which I guess was obviously the reason of playing a rook to c1. He wants to trade off my queen, which I think, well, that's fine. So. Here starts my plan. I think, well, I don't care if he trades on, on d5. I'll just take with the rook, and I'm still you know, putting some pressure on this d-pawn. I need to get rid of one of you know, the bishop and the knight or the defenders of this d-pawn. So I need to do something about those. And the way that I start proceeding is I play here f5. The idea is, well, I'm going to push this pawn to f4, and the bishop's going to have to move. And after the bishop moves, I'll have enough pieces to win that d-pawn. I think a quicker and better way to do this, a way that I didn't really consider, was to play g5. And by playing g5, I'm threatening not to, not to kick away the bishop, but to kick away the knight. And, you know, so I think this is a, probably a little bit of a stronger idea. This, this dark squared bishop isn't his best piece in the world. It's all trapped in behind his pawns. It's really just playing a defensive role at this point. So I think, you know, suppose he captures, captures. Um, I think this would probably be a slightly better variation than what I did. Um, he can still defend the pawn, rook c4. So now if I push, again, I think this is probably good for me. I'm gaining space. I don't win the pawn just yet, but um, again, I'm threatening now to do what I wanted to, play uh, f4 and f5. So again, I'm trying to uh, knock away these defenders. Not so much as win a piece, but just get rid of those defenders of the d-pawn. So... That, that's the point of my plan. Okay, so I play f5. Um, and again, I guess psychologically too, I thought this pawn is doubled. It would be nice to somehow do something with it, make it make it a little more active. Playing g5 to me just, um, I don't know, it, it was a very optical move that, that you know, I guess it, it felt like it would weaken the king side. But again, there's nothing attacking my king. Everything's solid over here. So would have been a better way to do it. But uh, I play f5. Queen takes, okay, there's that rook taking. So now I'm threatening to play f4, and again, win this d-pawn. So he plays rook c4. So again, now if I push immediately, he has enough pieces guarding everything. Again, um, just putting another rook on this d-file, putting more pressure on that d-pawn. So here he plays g3, which is a, a move that makes sense because, well, it helps overprotect this, this f4 square and keeps my pawn from coming. So at this point, I think, well, what do I... 
you know, what do I do? How do I keep the, the pressure up? Well, I can't play f4 immediately, again, because he's got enough protection on that square. So, the, again, the computer here recommends f6, and the idea is maybe in some lines to be able to play uh, g5. I did it a different way. I played h6. So my plan is to play uh, g5 and then also eventually to still get in f4. Okay, so he you know figures well it's going to take me a couple tempos to get in this 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 break on the king side. He gains more space b5. Again, I'm getting nervous here because if he can open this file, um, he takes, I take. If he can open this file and get a rook on b1, and he can get this rook into my position, it's going to cause me a little bit of stress, and I'm going to have to be careful. Well, there's nothing I can really do on the queen side. There's no way that I see to really defend it, so I just have to keep going forward with my plan. Play g5. Okay, here he plays rook e1. And this is a move that, again, probably wasn't the best move, but it was a move that I was slightly proud of. I didn't want to play f4 immediately. Again, it's probably not terrible. Um, suppose he defends. The thing I was worried about is if I went after this d-pawn immediately, um, he could now maybe play something like uh, a rook to, to d7. This probably actually isn't good for him, in fact, because I have this move f3. And that threatens mate in one. So I didn't get that far in my calculations for sure. Um, like I said, we were probably down. He was probably playing about three or four people at this point. So um, he was definitely coming by pretty quickly. So I didn't have time to analyze that. Um, I don't really see a good move for him in this position other than, than to maybe just play the rook back. So that probably would have been, uh, in hindsight, good for me. But at the time, just to show you what I was thinking, that was my concern. So I decided to play more solidly. I thought, you know, if all this stuff comes off the E file, I don't want his rook coming in here. So I played King F8. And it was funny, when he saw me play King F8, he kind of shrugged his shoulders and was like, well, I guess that, you know, I guess he was thinking I'm going to have to go somewhere else and do something different. So here he played Rook B1, and that move made me more nervous than Rook E1 because, again, he, this what I was talking about, he's now in a position to open this B file and infiltrate with the rook. All right, so I'm finally getting in this f4 push that I wanted. He takes, takes, and you've got to retreat the bishop somewhere. Um, bishop d2 is probably not the best because if there's some big exchanges on the d file, this, this, this bishop could potentially be hanging. So, for example, if we do all this stuff, he's going to have to waste a move now doing something to defend this bishop, and that's going to win a tempo for me. So it makes much more sense to do what he did, just play it all the way back to c1, really the only reasonable square. I think, well, my whole position up till now has been going for this d4 pawn, so let's get it. So I take, um, he plays king g2, again, it doesn't really make sense to, to capture. Um, whoops, it doesn't make sense to capture. I've got a much more dominating position now, this a pawn's under attack, his bishop's back here on the back rank. Um, he, he can't really move his rook off the back rank because I'm threatening a check and to pick up that bishop. So this would have been a dream for me had he done that. But of course, you don't almost become world champion by playing bad moves. He plays king g2. And the threat here is, well, it's not even a threat. The idea is if I take, he's just going to take um, and have his king in an active position. He's now going after back after this f4 pawn. Um, and he's got a, a, a certainly, I would say, an equal position. Okay, so takes, he plays there. This is a move that took me a second to find. I wasn't really sure how to follow this up. Again, I didn't like trading. Um, I didn't really see how to make good progress. So the move I made, again, one I'm a little proud of. I played just knight back to e6. It looks, again, it looks simple now. But the idea is, you know, I'm putting some pressure on the c5 pawn. If he does break open the queen side, my bishop is also going to be protected. This f4 pawn is also protected. Um, so this knight here on, on e6 is doing a lot of work. So he does open, he takes. Okay, there's finally that infiltration on the queen side I was worried about since about, you know, move 6 or 7. Um, he comes in with the rook, okay, attacking my 
my Apon. Again, at this point, we were basically playing like Blitz Chess, you know, even more than that. I was, I think I was making a move about every 10 seconds because I think it was, um, there was one board left and the guy was just getting demolished, you know. When you play Simuls, the idea is you, you, you basically don't resign. You try to keep, you, you try to prolong your, uh, your game to give the other people a little bit of time. That's kind of the etiquette. So anyway, I was looking at the guy's board next to me, and he was getting creamed, so Korchnoi wasn't really, you know, he, he was basically looking at my board while he was looking at the other guy's position. So, okay, I didn't want to give it up. Um, I just played here a5, and here he, he redeploys the bishop. He plays um, bishop b2, and unfortunately this is going to be a quick wind down, so... I thought, well, you know, maybe I can trade off some pieces. This bishop's getting really active. I actually have a, a, a still a, a, a better position. Um, like I said, I think from about whatever move it was, I, I had a better position. So I decided to trade off that active rook. And it was funny. He came back around um, after he saw this, and he was really excited. And he said in a very, very excited voice, he said, and this is the move I was looking at that I expected that I thought, you know, might give some trouble. He said, now I play this and he played knight d4 very excited so i guess he figured at this point he had equalized um i would disagree with that assessment the 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 computer i'm using or uh, looking at still gives me a uh, over a, a pawn advantage so it's definitely a, a very strong advantage so um and it was funny at this point he 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 whispered um he he offered a, a, a draw and uh um he he played that he he got he played the move excitedly and very quietly offered a draw, and um, it took me a second to process. He, you know he went to the other guy's board and then he came back and I was kind of in disbelief. I was like, "Did you offer me a draw?" And uh, he said, "You make a move first and then we we decide." But I, <laughs> um, the people were crowded around, started laughing. Some guy was like, "Oh, you know." At this point, it was pretty jovial. Um, he was, they were like, no, you offered a draw, and he cracked a big grin. And Korchnoi is known as being kind of a bit of a curmudgeon. Um, so, so to see that smile was, was really pretty awesome. And uh, the other thing, too, in chess is you have to make a move and offer a draw. So in a sense, it was actually improper and illegal for him to say, for me to make a move and then, you know, renegotiate the draw. So... Um, not quite proper on his end, but this was the end of the game. He played there, and I accepted the draw, and I went home a happy camper. So I even had a chance to talk to him after the game, and he, he praised the way I played and said I you know was much better the whole game. But uh, I definitely could have improved in a lot of places. But you know to hear something like that from again just a legend. I mean the guy is um, just a, 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 a you know just one of the top echelon chess players for a long time. Um, he's definitely declined in his old, older age, but um, you know, to play him and to hear that from him was, was, again, just a highlight for me. So maybe we can look at just a little bit more of the game, how I would have proceeded. I was definitely thinking about just trading here. Um, so if I had taken, um, you know, I guess uh, maybe rook d4. Again, I don't, you know, the this, this c-pawn isn't, isn't a worry because he can just play bishop a3 and now my rook is pinned. So that would have been a quick little uh, mistake uh, on my part. So here, you know, I'm, I'm not really positive what to do. Um, if you do something uh, like trying to develop your king more, again, this may be okay, but now he has this past C pawn that I'm going to constantly have to worry about. I also have this, this D pawn, but um, again, I'm not so sure. Um, there, there's certain things I could, you know, maybe check first if he plays king f3. Again, my f pawn's defended. I could maybe play something like bishop e5, um, going after his bishop, and to go into, um, to go into an endgame. I, if I remember correctly, this is actually what I was analyzing really quickly because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a pawn up in an endgame, um, and, and hopefully this isn't too bad for me. So I can even pick off another pawn. Um, you know, in retrospect, if I had had a little more time to analyze, I think I would have found this and would have went for this because it seems pretty natural now just looking at it. Um, but again, um, you know, I, my, my initial goal to go in, going into this was just not to get decimated. So um, I was super happy that I was able to, to, uh, uh, to get this far this quickly. Um, I want to look at one other line real quick. Suppose I take, 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 play this. Um, what if he plays check first? So... 
Um, after this, I guess it's basically the same variation, probably an improved variation for me. He's got to defend that bishop somehow, um, and his rook is under attack, so the only thing that makes sense again is back to d2. And if I take, take, I guess we basically get the same position we just had. So um, I think this would have been strong for me. Um, it maybe even, I, you know, I, I might have even been able to win it. But uh, um, I'll, I'll take, I'll take what I got. And um, so, so that's my game um, against Victor Korchnoi that I was able to draw again in a simul. So I'm sure if we played one to one, he would, he would uh, mow me down, mow me down. But um, again, a game I was proud of, and again, just super happy to play a legend such as him.